promised that much for me Yet what he asked was that I leave The world I knew and everything I own To give my life in service of The one who gave his life before That I might live by faith and not in fear Call to me when I would not come near Saying come on over Lay your worries down and on my shoulder This forgiveness you have found Your heavy burdens Every failure lay them down I am your God, you are my child and you are love Follow my son Follow my son God, your name is great and we will shout it High into the heavens now The skies they sing your power to the world May our praises rise high above As the smell of incense does And may the nations know how great you are You are the chaser of my Come on over Lay your worries down and on my shoulder This forgiveness you have found Your heavy burdens Every failure lay them down I am your God, you are my child And you are loved But you 
Lord, have mercy on us, Christ, have mercy. We are sinful, broken people needing grace. We've gone to find our own way, thinking little of your glory. But we ask for your forgiveness in this place. You are God, hear our cries to you, we pray. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Whether you are worshiping live with us here in the building or whether you are worshiping online, good morning to you. How did you start your day? This is a day that blank has made and there's a little bit of tension in you or a whole lot of tension. Or did you start your day? This is a day that God has made. And as soon as you said that, you have lifted your eyes to heaven. And the peace that he promises you, 
I pray is yours. Let me have a prayer with you. Heavenly Father, I, I think of our Lord. Sometimes he was preaching in the synagogues. Sometimes he was on a sandy beach. Sometimes he was out in the desert. Sometimes he was on a mountaintop. Sometimes his pulpit was Simon Peter's boat. And as I think about the different locations in this building that uh, I have used as a pulpit, I think of all of the locations that Jesus used. Heavenly Father, bless the worship this morning of your people. It is for two purposes, to fill us with your presence as we hear once again the stories of your power and your love. And once we are filled with your presence, then that divine power has to spill out. And we have to leave this worship changed to a small extent or to a large extent. But if we've been in God's presence, we have to leave this service changed. May it be so in our Lord's name. Amen. There's no space where his love can't reach There's no place where we can't find peace There's no end to amazing grace Take me in with his arms spread wide Take me in like an orphan child Never let go, never leave my side I am holding on to you I am holding on to you In the middle of the storm I'm holding on I am Love like God's heart. I am overwhelmed by the joy divine. Love like this sets our hearts on fire. I am holding on to you. I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm.
Our gospel is from the 11th chapter of Matthew, beginning at the first verse. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. This is the word of the Lord. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reverence, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planet's born. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. So will I. God of your promise.
heart through all of my failure and pride. On the hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. When you lost your life, so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart. could amount to your desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind If a song like that doesn't give you goosebumps, I don't know what will. There is a creed that was written a long, long, long time ago, centuries ago, and that creed reminds me of the song that we just sang because this creed is all about the power and the love of God himself. It is known to Christianity as the creed of the apostles, and I'm inviting you to join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. May this faith be your peace. In his name, amen.
Friends, uh, last week you saw the preacher with this background, and you were thinking that this week you would see the preacher in his robe in the sanctuary uh, behind that pulpit. Uh, they are putting carpeting down today, so that is why for a second week in a row, if you are looking at the traditional service, you are seeing this screen behind me. But as I prayed at the beginning of the message, our Lord, oh my goodness gracious, sometime his pulpit was the wilderness, the mountainside, Simon Peter's boat, the synagogue, uh, so we're fine. May the Lord bless our worship. Friends, I want to look at a text with you. It is Acts chapter 13, beginning at verse 36, and it is very intentional. When King David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his fathers. His soul was in heaven, but his body was buried with his fathers. When David had served God's purpose, it doesn't say that David served his own purpose. We can easily fall into that trap with our lives, thinking that life is all about us. It doesn't say when David had served his purpose. Nor did it say that David had served his kingdom's purpose. David died when he was 70 years of age. He had been the king of Israel for 40 years. And being the king of Israel was exceedingly, exceedingly important to him because he was a godly king. And so many kings that had gone before him, they worshipped idols. David took to heart the fact that he was prophet, priest, and king of those people. But it does not say... The writer Luke, it does not say when David had served Israel's purpose in his own generation. Oh my goodness, uh, Luke is very specific. He's writing about uh, David who had lived 900 years earlier, and he says very distinctly, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his father's. Uh, school is recently out. Uh, you have graduated. It was an end to the school year that uh, none of us have ever seen in our lifetime. We graduated without the ceremonies. Some graduations never happened. Some were with groups of five or ten families. Some were Zoom online and some were drive-bys. Uh, but you've graduated You've moved out of the elementary school and you'll be in junior high next year. You moved out of the junior high building, you'll be in high school. You moved out of the high school and you're going to be in a trade school or you're going to be looking at your first job or you're going to be looking at college. There are specific moments in your life when you literally say to yourself or to others, what shall I make of my life? You do that automatically when you graduated from high school. What shall I make of my life? You say it when you've graduated from college. What shall I do now? What shall I make of my life? If you've been married and now you're divorced, you sit and say, what shall I make of my life? When the little one in your family is now six years of age and they're in first grade and you've been a stay-at-home mom for all of these years, you say, what shall I make of my life now? And if your spouse dies, and all of a sudden that person who's been in your life for such a long time, they're not there anymore, you, you say, what shall I make of my life now that I'm a widow or a widower? And then there come specific moments in your life, moments that have affected a country, the COVID virus or the racial tensions, and you sit back on purpose and you reflect upon everything that's going on and you sit and say to yourself and you pray to God, what shall I make of my life? If you've been laid off work, if you've been furloughed, if your job existed before the COVID and it no longer exists, what shall I make of my life? The text, one brief shining word in the book of Acts, which describes the life that King David had. 
David served the purpose of God in his own generation. The first question in life is not how to make a living. The first question in life is how to make a life. Making a living is an incident, a very important one indeed, but it's an incident nonetheless. You can go to any number of schools, you can have any number of jobs, you know what I'm saying. But the making of a life is the primary meaning and mission of our earthly experience. The highest contribution which you can make to your generation, the people that God has allowed to be in your life when you're on this planet, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50, 70, 80, 100. The people that have been in your life in the realm of friend, family, or strangers. The contribution you make to them is the gift of a well-rounded and a worthy life. And that's what David's life was. It was well-rounded and it was worthy. Was it perfect? Far from it. Hebrews 5, 8, there's only one perfect and that's Jesus. David sinned as readily as do any of us. David begged for forgiveness more readily than many of us do. For when he sinned in a life which he was trying to live for the purpose of God, it cut him to the very core. And he would write things like a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And that is what I am bringing to you because I want to live to serve your purpose and I have failed badly in the making of a well-rounded and worthy life, certain principles must be faithfully regarded. And those principles are in this one verse, all packed together in the one verse, Acts 13, 36. David served, principle number one. David served his own generation, principle number two. And number three, David served his own generation, for the purpose of God and by the will of God. First point then, graduates or anyone else who's listening, the business of life is service. David served. It's the supreme test of life, test of service. It is our Lord's measuring stick of our lives. For he said in John 15, by their fruits, you shall know them. He doesn't say by their words you shall know them. He says by the fruits that they bear, you shall know them. The one divinely ideal life that this world has ever seen, the life of our Savior Jesus, it is portrayed in five brief words. For the Bible says about Jesus, he went about doing good. Five words. He went about doing good. If there was an epitaph on his tombstone, it would have said he went about doing good. The divine emphasis on life is on deeds. The faith that you have in the reality of God, the faith that you have in the promises of God, the faith that you have in the commands of God being correct for you and for others. It will manifest itself in the deeds that are done. Gladstone was one of the most significant men in this world's history. His primary greatness was an astonishing faith in his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He never wearied of saying, one concrete example is worth a thousand arguments. He would say it a thousand times in the course of five or ten years, when he opened his mouth, they knew what he was going to say. One concrete example is worth a thousand arguments. I'm sure he said it so often that they finished the sentence for him, and they knew exactly what he was meaning when he said it, and they knew exactly why he was saying it at the moment he said it. One concrete example is worth a thousand arguments. What the world needs is service. The six decades that God has allowed me on this earth, 
That generation that I have touched since I was a young child, three or four years of age, playing with the next door neighbor kids. The lives that I touched in elementary school, North Heights School, and then Jasper, Minnesota. The lives I touched in high school, the lives I touched in two colleges, the lives I touched in seminaries. The lives that I touched, the generations that were on this earth as I worked at many a part-time job. And the lives I touched in nine years of ministry, Holy Cross, Wichita, Kansas. And the lives I've touched in 32 years of ministry here at Trinity. The lives that I've touched are the generations that God allowed me to cross paths with. And those lives include the Gold's Gym and the L.A. Fitnesses and the marathons that I ran and every person that I've ever bumped into on this earth. God had a purpose, his own generation. I had a man drive by the house a couple of weeks ago. I'm working in the backyard and, and he's driving a beater and he gets out of the car and he walks into my backyard and I'm instantly a little bit nervous why he's doing this. And he says, can you help me? My car's not working. Can you drive me to the house where I live? Uh, and can you help me pick up some parts? And can you give me some money? And I was a little bit nervous. And I asked my next door neighbor, Mike, I said, can you get in the car with me? I'm a little bit nervous about this situation. But I kept thinking about this individual that maybe this is an angel that God has sent into my life at this moment on this day to see what I would do. Would I turn my back on him and say, sorry, can't help you, would you please leave? Or was he someone that God sent to see what I would do with this circumstance? What the world needs is service. The wounds and the hurts that exist on this earth, whether it's prejudice or narcissism or critical natures or self-interest or bigotry or jealousy or materialism or finger-pointing, this world's wrongs and this world's hurts cannot be staunched but by service. Words can be spoken. They are all the time. Words can be spoken. They are all the time. But the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 4, 20, the kingdom of, of God is not a matter of words coming out of your mouth. It's a matter of power and deeds coming out of your hearts. You've graduated. What shall you make of your life? James 2, 17, faith if it is not accompanied by works, is a dead thing. The wrongs on this earth cannot be righted. The grievances cannot be redressed. The injustice can, cannot be corrected. The ignorance cannot be dissipated, but by service. Your service proves your faith. The reality of it or the lack of it. You can say to someone, I love you, and if the word is a noun, it doesn't go very far. If you say to someone, I love you, and it's a verb, it's an action, then that person who receives that word will never forget it. Could it be that every person that God has sent into your life is sent by God for a direct purpose, and that includes your enemies? Romans 12, when it talks about this transforming work of the Spirit, it says you'll end up loving your enemies. You'll bless those who curse you. John 15, 8, and Jesus was very blunt. He said, It is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, thus proving yourself to be my disciples. What he was saying is, if you're not bearing fruit, don't kid yourself. Don't kid someone else, they'll call you a hypocrite. And don't kid me. If you're not bearing fruit, you are not my disciple. I love 1 Corinthians 13. I've read it at every wedding that I've ever done. 1 Corinthians 13. You could speak in the tongue of angels. 
But if you do not have a loving spirit, you're nothing. You can have all wisdom and fathom all mysteries. But if you do not have a loving spirit, you're nothing. You can give everything you have to the poor. But if you do not have as your motive a loving spirit, you're nothing. And you can give your body to be burned as a martyr. But if you do not have a loving spirit, you are nothing. Our service is motivated by love. There are three great motivations on this earth. The first one is a very ugly one. It's selfishness. The second motivation on this earth is praise from people. It's called altruism. You do something for somebody because you hope someone in the newspaper will see it and write you up. You do something nice for someone because you want them to acknowledge what you've done. And if they don't thank you or don't pat you on your back, quite frankly, you're offended. (laughs) You can't do things with the motive of altruism because human nature and human beings will fail you. Even your closest friends will fail you at times. If your motive for your deeds of love is truly love for God, then God will never disappoint you. He'll never turn his back on you. Acts of service motivated by love, and that's all the difference in the world. Matthew seven twenty one. I think one of the harshest words Jesus ever spoke It was right after the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he said, Why do you bother to call me Lord? Why do you pretend to call me Lord? Who are you trying to impress by calling me Lord? And you do not do the things which I ask you to do. John 3, 36, pretty blunt. Whoever believes in Jesus has everlasting life. Whoever does not obey his words does not have life. And what were his words? New commandment, I give you, love one another. By this will others know you are my disciples, not by the words that come out of your mouth, but by the love they see coming from you. As I have loved you, so ought also you to practice that with others. What do we have in Jesus? One of those great verses in the Bible, Philippians 2, 5, we we always read it during Lent, Good Friday, Easter. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus our Lord, who being in the form of God did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself and took on him the form of a what? Took on him the form of a teacher? No. Took on him the form of a philosopher? No. Took on him the form of a miracle worker? No. Took on him the form of a servant. And being found in form of a servant, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And because his life was one of service, giving himself for the sins of mankind, God has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under this earth. Faith is more than a dogma. Faith is more than a teaching. It's more than a philosophy. Faith is a living passion. Faith will lift, faith will achieve, and faith will find its completion in service. Great believers have always been great doers. You witness Moses in the Old Testament, you witness the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. You witness the army of pioneers and builders from Abraham 2,200 years before Jesus is born until John writing the last book of the Bible. Great believers are always great doers. 
The teachings of Jesus, utterly revolutionary as to the supreme things in life, he never gave a little answer to a big question. Never did. The lawyer comes to him and he asked this question, very clever. He said, who's my neighbor? Jesus said, you should serve your neighbor. And the clever lawyer said, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus answered with a parable of the Good Samaritan. Whether you're in the secular realm, you know the story of the Good Samaritan. If you're in the Christian community, you know the story of the Good Samaritan. And the teaching of that parable is that our neighbor, you graduates, the teaching of that parable, you widow and widowers, the teaching of that parable, you sorority sister, your fraternity brother, the teaching of that parable is that your neighbor is anybody and everybody, anywhere and everywhere who is in need of our help. That's your neighbor. A man named John Day, who I'd never seen before, coming into my backyard, scaring the dickens out of me. Why, that's my neighbor. No matter the creed, the color, the tongue, the age, the sex, the social status, God always said the same thing. He never changed it. He said, every life on this earth matters. And if I put that life in the purview of your path, I want one thing from you. I want acts of service done. The motive being love for me and love for them. Jesus reverses the commonly accepted standards of greatness when he said in Matthew 20, 26, listen carefully, whoever wants to be great among you must be servant of all, and whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of all. Even as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. Are there hindrances to this? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Are there difficulties to this? Absolutely. Are there costs to this? Yes. But you must give voice of your faith to those who need you here, there, everywhere. Give voice to your faith. Was there a divide when the Bible was written? Absolutely. Galatians 5, 6. My goodness. Was there a divide? Yeah. You were a Jew or a Gentile. Gentiles hated the Jews. Jews hated the Gentiles. Life and death often. Was there a divide in the Bible? Yes, there was. Circumcision, uncircumcision. Churches were split. Communities were split. Lives and blood were shed over the issue of circumcision or uncircumcision. Were there divides in the time of the Bible? Yes. You were slave or you were free. I said a couple of weeks ago, 60% of the Roman Empire was slaves. You were slave or you were free. Were there divides in the Bible time? Yeah, there were. Male or female, if you were male, you were everything. If you were female, you were dust on the ground. Here came the Christians. Here came the Christians. Everyone who's baptized into Christ has put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither circumcised nor uncircumcised. We're all called to be one in Christ. And these incredible words in Galatians 5, 6, where the Apostle Paul, putting his life on the line and his reputation on the line, risking death by writing these words, said, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. He didn't say faith expressing itself in words. He says, faith expressing itself in love. What's the world's standards of greatness? At one time, it was physical strength. Hercules was worshipped. 
Might makes right was espoused. The strong survive and the weak die. One empire after another, Rome, Egypt, Medo-Persian, Egyptian, one empire after another, the strong survive and the weak die. For others, the standard of greatness is financial. President William Taft once warned that the enthronement of the spirit of materialism in this country's life constitutes the most serious menace to our nation and our republic. He said, materialism looks at things and denigrates people. Materialism is all about a selfish desire for you to be lifted up and others to be left behind. The true wealth of a country is not financial, it's not physical, it's not intellectual, it's spiritual and it's moral. And the highest standard of greatness, you heard it 20 minutes ago, you're hearing it 20 minutes later. The greatest of all must be the servant of all, period. Last week, I said to you, Mary's word to the servants at the wedding feast, whatever he tells you to do, thou must do it. I don't know whether Mary said to the servants, don't tell him it's too little and you don't want to waste your time. Don't tell him it's too big and you can't do it. Don't tell him, I'll get back with you later, Jesus. Uh, give me an hour, I'll be back with you. Don't argue with him, don't debate with him, don't philosophize with him, don't rationalize with him. When he tells you to do something, do it. Looking at me, right? Looking at the camera, man. When he tells you to do something, do it. And when I look at my face in the mirror, I say, when he tells you to do something, do it. Closing word. All the extra power you have because the gifts God has given you. All the powers at your control, physical, financial, social, intellectual, moral, spiritual, all power is under God's bonds. They have been loaned to you. They can be taken back at any time. Use those gifts to serve humanity. Don't hoard your gifts and powers for yourself. Don't squander your gifts and powers as a spendthrift does. How should your life be spent? David served. The purpose of God in his own generation. And then he fell asleep. Is life changing, Heavenly Father, when this occurs? When the operation described in Romans 12 occurs, it is life changing. It doesn't make our life more difficult, it makes it easier. That's what Jesus meant when he said, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I am gentle and humble in heart and I'll give rest for your souls. When we finally come to the conclusion that life is not about us, then a lot of fears and worries disappear because we're not looking at ourselves all the time. Our weight, our size, our shape, our color, our financial situation. When we come to the realization that life is about service, we wake up of a morning, we say, this is the day God has made. We sit and say, I can hardly wait to see what person or circumstance God brings into my path. We've already geared ourselves early in the morning to looking for situations, not that deal with us, but that deal with others. And then all the pressure is off. That's why you ask us to be that type of person. Because a weight is lifted from us. You give us a great peace 
when we realize we are put on this earth to feed hungry, give drink to the thirsty, visit the sick, clothe the naked, to visit those in any sort of prison. That's what I'm looking for, Lord. And that is what brings joy to your heart, peace to mine, and the glory of the presence of God to the person that has been helped. May it be so, Lord, in our Savior's name. Amen. At this time, dear friends, we would normally be gathering the offering. And as I've said every week, and I never get tired of saying it because I don't know what the week is going to bring. What I see from you is what I've just preached about. I see your faith manifested in your works. That's in your prayers. That's in your acts of kindness. Some I hear about from other people. Is so-and-so a member of your church? Yeah, they are. Well, this is what they just did for me. Oh, my goodness. I thank you for your prayers, for your acts of kindness, and for the unending devotion you have given to the offerings that you've sent online, that you bring when you come to worship, or that you mail back to us. Because whenever you do that, you're not just verbally saying, I'm a servant of God. You are sacrificially giving of your time and your talents and your treasures. You're not hoarding what God has given you. You're not squandering it. You're saying, God, here. And God is blessed in the ministries of this place continue to serve God's kingdom. Heavenly Father, bless the offerings of your people. Bless the prayers of your people. And bless endlessly the acts of kindness from your people. Such things we ask in our Lord's name. Amen. We go now to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you bless us as your children. And as we share the, the good news of Jesus to others, may we be lights in a, a, a world that doesn't really know you very well. And may your word just reach and touch hearts and lives so that many more may come into your family and to know not only of life here, but also eternal life in Christ, in heaven, and a resurrection to a new world where there is no pain or sorrow or anguish. Lord, as we come close to a holiday weekend, we certainly ask your blessings upon those who travel. Uh, be with them, Lord, wherever they may go. Uh, keep them safe uh, in the places that they travel to. And Lord, keep us all safe uh, as a nation and the nations of the world. Give peace to be the main thing that is most prevalent in the lives of those who live all around the world. Bless our leaders and the leaders of the nations that they may strive for that peace. We ask your healing and your strength for Mary Compton, El Willie, Pat Neese, and Eleanor Gilmore. Lord, bless them in their lives and may your strength be theirs. For those who are going through the effects of the virus and those who are battling it in finding treatments and vaccines, we just ask that you would guide us all and be with us, Lord. All these things we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Today we also pray the Independence Day prayer together. Lord of all nations, we thank and praise you for the blessings you have so mercifully and abundantly showered on our nation. Thank you for the richness of the earth, water, soil, and minerals the richness of commerce and industry, and above all, the richness of our diverse and free people. Give us wisdom and courage to face the injustices and inequalities that exist among us. Give us a heart for the vulnerable, the poor, the aged, and the unborn. May liberty, justice, right, and decency flourish among us. 
Curb the forces of vulgarity and meanness. Silence the voices that exploit our fears and feed our prejudices. In your grace, help all our citizens to love mercy, act justly, and walk humbly before you. In Jesus' name, amen. And together we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Come all you weary, come all you saints, come to the fountain, to the edge of the banks, the water's stirring, tides are now turning, jump in the river of grace, the spirit is searching, Hearts are returning, jump in the river of grace. I am not who I once was. My whole life has been changed. Met the forgiver, and now this sinner will never be the same. took my guilt Carried the hurting of Calvary's hill It's calling the lost to the foot of the cross Where all the broken I healed but He died my death to give me His breath Oh, how my future is
that much for me Yet what he asked was that I leave The world I knew And everything I own To give my life in service of The one who gave his life before That I might live by faith And not in fear Call to me when I would not come near Saying come on over Lay your worries down and on my shoulder This forgiveness you have found Your heavy burdens Every failure lay them down I am your God, you are my child And you are love Follow my son Follow my son God, your name is great And we will shout it High into the heavens now The skies they sing your power to the world May our praises rise high above As the smell of incense does And may the nations know how great you are You are the chaser of my Saying, come on over, lay your worries down and on my shoulder. This forgiveness you have found, your heavy burdens. 